On the outskirts of Georgetown, Guyana, these children take an afternoon stroll just opposite the country's iconic seawall. As they grow older, it is uncertain whether they'll be able to take this same walk in a few decades. The Caribbean is undergoing a transformation due to climate change, from the sargassum that sits on the surface of its seas to the coral reefs dying on its seabed. Fishermen are confronting the full brunt of rising sea levels and rising temperatures. We have to spend more in petrol. Two, we have to spend more time at sea. And three, there's a high risk when you go further. My story takes me to four Caribbean islands sitting on the front line of the climate crisis. I'm exploring how climate change is changing what we can and can't see. My journey starts in Guyana. From an early morning jog to hanging out at nights, this seawall is a popular location, but it's also an important one. If you want to examine the sea level rise in the Caribbean, then there's hardly a better place to do it than Georgetown, Guyana. Stretching over 280 miles along Guyana's Atlantic coast, this seawall I'm standing on is not just an emblem of history, or an historical landmark. It is the last line of defense. Built in the 1800s by the Dutch, this seawall separates the sea from the city. Without it, Georgetown, Guyana and its coastal communities will flood. Some of the coastal communities in Georgetown lie at six feet below sea level. Without it, those communities will flood and it's not just with rainfall. It could be as simple as something like high tide. Now, as climate change accelerates and sea level rise accelerates with it, this seawall becomes even more critical to the people of Guyana. And all the focus now is on whether the sea level rise will be able to one day breach this barrier. With an average 3.4 millimeter sea level rise per year for the last three decades, it's a concern for this nation that lies below sea level. But a natural phenomenon may be helping Georgetown. Experts estimate for the last millennium, a mud bank from the Amazon has been migrating to the Guyanese capital, helping to bolster its defense, albeit underwater. This particular mud bank that's been traveling from the mouth of the Amazon to us probably for the last thousand years, it is one of the largest mud banks we've seen in a generation. And what is triggered is a, is a deposition of material in front of Georgetown and an expansion of mangroves on those new mud flats. So without any kind of um, human engineering, nature is starting to heal a coast that hasn't had these mangroves in front of it for, you know, many generations. Damien Finanz lives in the shadow of the seawall in Georgetown. He says while the mud bank is a huge bonus at a time when the impacts of climate change are worsening, complacency could be costly. So even though the wall has held, we, are, we have now come to a point in our understanding of our landscape that, that the, the wall is not enough. Walls aren't enough anymore. Uh, right to these frontiers of water and land, you know, uh, between, you know, high tide and low tide, between people and nature. Our walls aren't going to save us at that, at that boundary. He insists a connection with nature is needed to complement the resistance of the seawall. But below the surface of the sea, Climate change is also destroying the Caribbean's coral reefs. Tobago knows it too well. Part of the island's tourism package includes glass-bottom boats that take visitors on a trip to see the coral reefs. It's been struggling since 2010. Over the last 10 years, we've seen significant de decline in coral cover. Most notable of that was the 2010 bleaching event, where we saw a decline in 50% of our coral cover and in the 
15 years after that, we've not seen an, a significant increase in coral cover. This means that there are chronic issues that are preventing natural coral recovery. Dr. Anjani Ganes works with the Institute of Marine Affairs. They are based in Charlottesville, the northeastern tip of the island, and are tasked with monitoring the reefs. She says there have been three bleaching events in the last 15 years. What is alarming is that after these coral bleaching events, we see, we're seeing very little recovery of the corals before the reefs are hit with another disturbance, whether it is disease or another bleaching event. And essentially what climate change is doing is increasing the rate of disturbances so that the corals don't have a chance to recover. Coral reefs are important because they support biodiversity, protect coastlines from erosion, and benefit the tourism and fisheries sectors. Dr. Ganes and her team are working on restoring the reefs, but she insists they need the help of both people and policies. Despite the fact that we've seen significant declines in our reefs, we still struggle with managing and protecting our marine areas and regulating uh, local impacts such as land-based sources of pollution, regulation of our fisheries. These are um, these are basic management strategies to keep our, our corals healthy and to aid in the recovery. It's a seismic task for her and her team as the oceans continue to warm at an alarming rate. But if you take a 90-minute drive south to Buku, there's a similar story from fishermen. Curtis Douglas has been a fisherman for over 35 years and the president of the All Tobago Fisher Folk Association, a body that speaks on behalf of fishermen on the island, for the last five years. In the last decade, he says they've seen a decline in the red belly flying fish, the normal flying fish, tuna, black-eyed kingfish, wahoo, and salmon. One of the factors we would have seen in, in, in Tobago, in Trinidad and Tobago, is one, the rising of the temperature, the rising of the temperature in, in our waters. I think last year, last year, was one of the hottest temperature the world would have ever seen, we would have ever seen. That warming is proving costly to Tobago's fishermen. Once it gets warmer, that means fish don't reproduce as they should. That means we will have problems in catching the amount that we should. So that means also, that also demonstrate that we have to go further. Long time we used to go two, three miles. Now we have to go 35, 40, 20 odd miles just to make a yield. So one, we have to spend more in petrol. Two, we have to spend more time at sea. And three, there's a high risk when you go further. So it, it, it runs the risk of your, 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 your safety network not covered as it should. He warned if the impact of climate change on the sector isn't addressed urgently, the island will have to look for its favorite meal elsewhere. Everywhere you look on the island, climate change is leaving its mark. Sargassum stains its pristine beaches. But that's a regional problem. On a recent return trip to Trinidad from Dominica, pools of sargassum seaweed can be seen from the sky littering the Blue Caribbean Sea. In May, the amount of sargassum in the Caribbean and the Atlantic reached a record-breaking 39 million tons, weighing heavily on the region's tourism sector. But here in Trinidad, there's another evolving climate crisis for those who live on the island's coastlines, coastal erosion. On the southwestern peninsula, the community of Cedrus is being eroded by rising sea levels. These two men have lived here all their lives. They tell me 60 years ago, the land reached as far as the brown line in the ocean. Sugarcane and coconuts thrived. Since then, the water has reclaimed most of that land and now it's eating into the mountain. As difficult as it might be to believe, this was actually a road that went all the way across to where we were before. But in 2019, due to coastal erosion, this entire road collapsed. You can see the depth by which the water would have taken back its land. And now, there is even more concerns because along here are further cracks. And these cracks can also fall off at any time. More alarmingly, in 2019, when this would have been lost to the sea,
The entire stretch of this community evacuated in a hurry. They packed up their belongings and they left because their houses were also in danger. After six years, they are yet to return. All along the coastline, there are similar scenes. But those residents weren't the only ones to have to evacuate. Along this trail I'm walking right now, behind me and to my left are houses where people lived for decades before being forced to evacuate because of coastal erosion. They had direct TV, they had a life here before having to leave it. To my left, you can see the roof of a house now overgrown with bushes. It's a common story here in Cedrus on this coastline, how lives have been upended due to this climate change phenomenon. The sea coming in more, it taken more land because it washed out all the, almost all the point and cedars. We had about three or four point and cedars, it, it almost washed out. So in future that we wouldn't have known. They had houses by the beach, people had to leave the house, the house and them gone on. He had one down, one two down there, that whole house in the beach too, it washed out. Even going down, down by Mr. Siwa down, San Marie down there, he placed cave in down San Marie Point. The, the place is very, very fast, very fast. Lalchan Bodhi tells me, with the climate changing drastically, the future for his community looks bleak. And as the sea level continues to rise each year, and the waters continue to warm, the Caribbean is coming face to face with its biggest challenge of this century, one that threatens to erode its traditional ways of living and take down livelihoods with it. Ryan Bechu, CNC3 News.